blessing uh, in Jesus' name. Lord Jesus, we thank you for an opportunity to be in your house once again, Lord. We thank you for being so good to us, Lord. We praise your wonderful name, Lord. We praise you. Bless this lesson, Lord. And Lord, Lord, just tell us what we need to hear. And I pray God you bless us all in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Well, good morning, everybody. It's a good morning to get involved in church, get in the Word of God. And our lesson today is living by faith. I mean, if that's ever an important lesson, that's the lesson, to live by faith, because you can't please God without it. Are you wanting to please God? Amen. Amen. Then you've got to live by faith. Amen. So we're going to go into that lesson. We're going to start with 1 John chapter 5, verse 4. Because faith is going to lead you into an experience with God, and it's going to be a new birth. But you've got to live by faith after the new birth. I heard one preacher say that once you got the ticket, you're okay. But that's not the truth. You get obeying the scripture and get filled with the Holy Ghost, baptized, of course, in Jesus' name, and know who your God is, the Lord Jesus Christ. You got the ticket, but you better walk by faith, because the just shall walk by faith. And so we talked about, let me just welcome our <clears throat> web viewers, and uh, you are going to be uh, taught the truth here. Caller of First Pentecostal Church is going to teach you the truth concerning the Word of God. We're not going to sugarcoat it. We're not going to just, just lala to sleep. We're going to give you the truth. We're going to give you some meat, and it's going to save your soul. So the scripture says in 1 John chapter 5, verse 4, For whatsoever is born of God overcometh the world. And this is the victory that overcometh the world, even our faith. Say, our faith. our faith. Amen. Our faith is biblical faith. It is not religious faith. It's biblical faith. And there's a difference. You can believe in your head and an idea all you want. And you can confess that, confess it, and confess it. That's not faith. I'm going to teach you a little bit this morning. Amen. We talked in week four in March 22. I taught the lesson justified by faith. Now we're talking about living by faith. And so we're going to go to Hebrews uh, chapter 11. This is the, we call the Hall of Fame of the Faithful. And... Um, Chapter 1, verse through 8. Now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. For by it, by faith, the elders obtained a good report. Through faith, we understand that the worlds were framed by the word of God. So that things which are seen were not made of things which do appear. By faith, Abel offered unto God a more excellent sacrifice than Cain, by which he obtained witness that he was righteous, God testifying of his gifts, and by it he be, being dead yet speaketh. By faith, Enoch was translated that he would, should not see death, and was not found, because God had translated him. For before his translation, he had this testimony that he pleased God. Hmm. But without faith, it is impossible to please him. For he that cometh to God must believe that he is, and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. Diligently seek him. By faith, Noah, being warned of God, of things that uh, seen uh, as yet, not seen as yet, moved with fear, prepared an ark to the saving of his house, by the which he condemned the world 
and became heir of the righteousness which is by faith. By faith, Abraham, when he was called to go into a place which he should after receive for an inheritance, obeyed. And he went out, not knowing whether he went. And these things I'm just are mentioned here because there's so much to say about the faithful, about those that obeyed God, those that feared God, those that walked and pleased God. It was all done because of faith, their faith in God. And so Christianity in the New Testament, when we talked about it and we read the scripture, it was known as the way. That's what it was known as, the way. And <clears throat> the way of truth, the way of faith. And so <clears throat> it is a living faith. And what do we mean by a living faith? A living faith is because we serve a living God. We can't see him, though sometimes he makes himself known. Sometimes he makes himself understood. And... We get rewarded because of our diligence. He will reward us. And so we come into a realm of, well, spiritual faith. Uh, spiritual is so much different than religion. Religion is just the same old routine, the same old thing. Nothing changes in here. We just have an outside uh, appearance. But inside, we're not changed. But spirituality, walking by faith, a living faith, we become changed from the inside out. And that's what God wants to do. So the just shall live by faith every day. And they live their lives out through faith. It's not a blind faith, but it's a living faith. And because we serve a living God, he might decide to speak something to your heart like he did Abraham. Pick up your bags, pick up your belongings, and go. And Abraham obeyed. He didn't know where he was going. He just walked by faith. And so we see all through these faithful people that are mentioned that they live their lives out, in a sense, by faith, serving the living God. And so our lesson on justification by faith was because of the righteousness of God is imputed to us by a just God and putting our faith in him we have access by faith into his grace into his love into his kingdom into knowing him and understanding him so what is God's grace well in Romans 3 23 we talk about we have access into this grace by faith and in Titus chapter 2 verse 11 we go into what it is. It's God's willingness. Grace is God's willingness and desire to reveal himself to you and me. And for the grace of God that bringeth salvation hath appeared to all men, all mankind. And who is that? Jesus Christ. It goes on to say in Titus 3, chapter 4, verse through 5, teaching us what? Well, it's teaching us, it tells us to deny ungodliness and worldly lusts. We should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world. That's what it tells us. That's what the grace of God instructs us in the sense. When we get into the grace of God, we get to know him, understand him, because his ways are What's the scripture say? Are not our ways. And his thoughts are not our thoughts. He is so above 
our thinking and living. But by faith, we can get access to him through his grace. And his grace, of course, is himself revealing himself. So <clears throat> we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world. And what are we looking for by faith? Looking for the blessed hope and glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. Who's Jesus Christ? Our great God and Savior. Amen. Period. And so Jesus Christ, the Lord Jesus Christ, is Almighty God revealing himself to us. So it goes on to say, who gave himself. He didn't send another. The Christ was himself. And he gave, who gave himself for us that he might redeem us from all iniquity and purify unto himself a peculiar people. And what are they zealous of? Good works. Now, if you have faith, James says, and you don't have works, what is your faith? It's dead. You know, these, these people that say, you know, all they need to do is have faith in God. They don't have to go to church. Or if they go to church, it can be any time they want to go. But the body of Christ assembles itself. All right? The body of Christ does assemble itself. And we are together as a body. And um, James goes on to say, for what, in James chapter 2, verse 14, and I'm going to go a little further because we got some time here because I want to define some things. People have a misconception of what grace is. They have a misconception of what faith is. And so, or even what believing God is. So James says this in James chapter 2, verse 14 through 26. For what does it profit, my brethren? Though a man say, speak. Because, you know, this is, there's a whole lot of faith teachers out there that say, oh, speak this, speak. If a man say or speak, he have faith and have not works, can faith save him? The faith teachers would say yes. All you need is faith. All you need to do is believe in God. You're okay. I'm telling you what the scripture says, because the scripture says is the truth. And the truth says this. Faith alone is dead without works. Abraham, our father, was justified by works. Oh, my goodness. I thought in Christianity, we don't have anything to do with works. I thought it was all grace, 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 grace. No. Abraham, our father, was justified not only by faith, but by works. And by works, he offered Isaac on the altar. That took some faith. I mean, it's one thing I can understand. I can, I can get a hold of what Abraham experienced when the Lord told me, when I lived in Massachusetts, go to Memphis. And I had a great job and, uh, and, and all this other stuff was going on. My family was up there. And by faith, I obeyed. I can relate to Abraham leaving his home. But when Abraham got into that dimension that he was willing to obey God, because God said, offer Isaac your only son on this particular mountain. And... Uh, he took the boy, and I don't know, some speculate he was almost 20 years of age, or right around 20. And so, took him, got him on the donkey, got the wood, and off they went. But by faith, he said, we're going up yonder to worship God, me and the lad, and we're going to return. So, in the heart and in the mindset of Abraham, Abraham knew, if I put this son of mine to death, God was able to raise him up. That was the faith that Abraham had. Now, God did it 
to test and prove. But I got this, I got this suspicion that it was one of these Job deals where Lucifer approached uh, God and, and said, you know, you know about this Abraham guy? I bet if you da-da-da-da-da-da-da, he would deny you and he won't do it. That's my suspicion. And God put Abraham to the test, like he put Job to the test. I don't want to get put to the test like that. I don't know if I could pass that test, to be honest with you. But God knows our limits, and he will not put things on us, right, Brother Blanton, that we would just fall under that weight and lose our faith. He knows our limits. But nevertheless, here's what the Scripture says about Abraham. By, uh, by works, he offered Isaac, and it was... To, the scripture says his faith was made perfect, complete. Abraham's faith was tested, and it was, it was like he finished the finish line. He proved the devil wrong and proved that God was his God, the true God, the living God, that the Lord was his God. And the scripture was fulfilled, which said Abraham believed God. And it was imputed unto him for righteousness. And he was called what? The friend of God. That's powerful. That is powerful. But I want you to see, it goes on to saying this. You see then how that by works a man is justified and not by faith only. Then it goes into saying, for you ladies, God puts this scripture in out of the blue. He's, he, he says this. He says, Rahab, the female who hid the spies, also was justified by works. And then it goes on to say, for as the body without the spirit is dead, so faith without works is dead also. For we must have faith plus works. Faith plus works equals believing God. That's what the formula says. Abraham had faith. Abraham obeyed. He had works, being obedient to God. And it, Scripture says it was counted. It, he believed God, and then it Righteousness was imputed to him, and he was called the friend of God. So faith without works is dead, and of course, faith plus works equals believing God. That's the biblical wording of faith. It is a living faith, and it pleases God. And we need to please God. A living faith was known as the way. In Jesus' time and his disciples, Jesus said, I'm the way. I'm the truth, and I'm the life. And so following Jesus Christ requires taking up your cross because it's sacrificial. It's sacrificial. We need to take up our cross and follow Jesus Christ. And when we have this kind of grace, God's willingness and desire to reveal himself to all of creation and we are the crown of his creation. We are made in his likeness and his image. We lost it in Adam, but we regain it in Jesus Christ. Can you say amen? And so that's our hope. We got that second chance. The angels never had that opportunity. Once they sinned, it was a done deal. Judgment. Once we sinned in Adam, God came to our rescue. Can you imagine that? The love of God in Christ Jesus, amen, reached out, redeemed us, amen, from the hand of our enemy, Satan. All right, so faith is our, what is faith? Faith is our personal imit uh, Im intim uh, I'm not even saying it right. Say it. Intimate. I very rarely use that word. 
I don't use that word with my wife. I just get plain. All right. So, I'm, what can I say? You want me to go any further? All right. By faith. What is faith? It's your personal, intimate, intimate knowledge of the person, the identity, and the plan of God. So what, why, why do you need to know him and who he is? Why do you need to know his plan? Well, so you can discern spiritually. And in your discerning it, you can act in harmony with him and obeying him like Abraham, like all through the heroes of faith. Once you get to know him, once you get to get into a place with him, where you're interacting with him. It's not all you praying. It's you praying and you listening and obeying what the king says. And so when God speaks, you obey. And so that's the kind of faith that pleases God. It pleases him when we listen and obey. Now, we can do that just by reading the word because we can understand God's ways through his word. But we also have opportunity to live out our faith and hear something from God because it's a still, small voice that God speaks to us. And when we're listening, we can obey. And in obeying, we can come into situations that, wow, God is at work here. I would have never known this person would follow God or, you know, want to be witness to or whatever. But the fact of the matter is, faith is, faith is, and when you put it in active mode, it's believing God. So, like all those that are mentioned in chapter 11 in Hebrews, we serve a living God and we have a living faith. And if our faith is strong, it's unshakable. It will cause you to be like Daniel. And I'll get to you, Brother Haley, where you can go into that den of lions, pray to your God, who's the living, and God will dispense angels. Or, in the case of the three Hebrew children, that the angel of the Lord would just show up in the furnace. But this is a f kind of faith that is living faith. Brother Haley. Praise the Lord. I'm a little bit reluctant to say this, but I want to share it with you. <clears throat> back when we was on White Haven, back on Range Road, a fella got the Holy Ghost, and he really wanted to do something, so I took him out with me one Saturday to pray. And this man, he was, boy, he just got the Holy Ghost. He was full of it. So we go to this rest home where this lady that I've been praying with been in a coma for 12 years. So we go out there and we lay his hands on her and she prayed and she didn't come around. So when he come out, and he's new, he hadn't, he hadn't been that long. Come out there, he, just, he said, man, what happened? I said, that woman was supposed to come up from there. I prayed but in faith. I said, well, let me explain something to you. So I let him know. But, but I asked you a question. It may sound stupid. Uh, is it possible, you know, it says in there, Lord, I believe, but help thou my unbelief. Right. Is it possible to believe in God, have faith, certain measure of faith, and not have enough faith to touch God? And I believe if, uh, believe faith and the will of God. Faith will touch the will of God. But even though we have faith and belief, sometimes it might not be the will of God for something to happen. I've had that happen me a few times. It might be just our will. Right. Yeah. We, we can get into that realm of what we want. And uh, James talks about that, too, that we have these things that we lust after and want. And, and lust is not a bad thing. It's just a strong desire that you want something to happen, and it might not be what God wants to happen. You know, I like to have a lot of money, but you know what? There's people that didn't have money, and then they got money, like in the lottery, do you know how many people end up bankrupt after having millions of dollars? A large majority of them. And then 
The Bible says in James that you end up going, you, you, you die in your sins because you get off track. Brother Blanton. What the Lord said when he said, if you have the faith of a grain of mustard seed, you know, you're going to move a mountain or a sycamine tree will be plucked up. Jesus rebuked people for having little faith. So when he said, if you have the faith of the grain of mustard seed, and although it starts out small, once it's planted, then it grows. It takes time. It becomes a huge tree. The fowls get in the branches, the beast under the shadow thereof. And then when it has increased, now see, they had faith. They said, Lord, increase our faith. Now again, if all they needed was a little faith, then why would they need more? You see what I'm saying? He rebuked people of little faith. So once it's grown to maturity, full capacity, then you can say to the mountain, be thou removed, to the sycamine tree, be plucked up and cast yonder, and it should obey you. So they had a desire to add to our faith, increase it, make it bigger, make it stronger. All right. And I want more faith in God. <laughs> yeah. Well, that's what the scripture says about Abraham. <clears throat> Abraham was tested, and it says that his faith was perfect, uh, uh, was perfected, or was complete. <clears throat> and it, trust me, Abraham walked with God a lot of years. This didn't happen in the very beginning. That's right. That's right. And it eventually, if you allow it, faith will grow. And your relationship with God will get deeper. And your diligence will be rewarded. Not in the next life. In this life. And it might not be money or houses. That, that you know, that... You know, we, we think material, material, but spiritually could be gifts of the Spirit. It could be uh, God positions you where you're going to be a pastor or, or, you know, an evangelist or whatever. But that's God's gifts and that's God's calling. But it all deals with faith, active. If you don't have active faith, then it's going to be the same old, same old. And you're going to go through the same routine. Well, I was just praying the other day. I told my wife, uh, this poor guy uh, in this apartment complex, he was wheeling down, and he's like in his, I think he's in his 30s. He's in a wheelchair, and the frame broke on it. And, uh, man, he was struggling to get that thing just to go down foot by foot, I mean, because the wheels were not lined up and everything else, and so I stopped and I said, let's pray about this, and I just ran into him the other day, and it hasn't even been a week. He said, you know, I was driving down the road with my, I think it was his uncle or brother or something, he says, and there was about six wheelchairs somebody had for sale, and I drove up, and uh, mind you, he didn't have a whole lot of money, okay? So I drove up, and the guy said, uh, it was a brand spanking new wheelchair. And I go for about 300 bucks, don't they? Somewhere around there. He said, $75. And then he said, uh, give me $60. He said, I couldn't take out 320s fast enough. And, he, and I seen him driving around that day, and he was so happy. But, uh, you know, simple prayers I didn't you know I prayed about it with him and I left it there and then God showed me look it I listened I set it up for him and I blessed him he, he, he don't go to church or nothing that I know of but just God you know faith pleases God and if God gets pleased he wants to help people Sometimes we just need to open our mouths and pray, even with strangers, you know. And uh, that's part of, could be part of outreach too. So, biblical faith equals pleasing God. And God is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. And that's, that's important for you and I to understand. It's not just if we're half-hearted. You know, you wonder why... Christians have such a hard time sometimes 
living for God. It's because, well, they'll show up on Sunday or they'll show up on a, a service when they feel like it. Or they'll tithe when they feel like it. Or they'll do other things. They're not obeying God. They're not truly serving God. They're coming to church and they think it's their duty and, and that they're just doing their duty. But the fact of the matter is, if you look at Scripture, Jesus says, take your cross up and follow me. It's a sacrificial faith, really, because there's going to times in your life you're going to be tested. And it's for the good. It's not that God's out to, you know, find weaknesses in you. He knows your weaknesses. He knows you like an open book. He knows your birth and he knows your death and he knows everything in between. It's you. It's you that God wants to get on track and have an, uh, a relationship with. And it's not just for the Abraham. It's not just for Rahab. It's not, and she wasn't even a Jew. It's not just for Joshua or David and all these heroes and Moses and all the heroes of faith that is in this chapter 11. But it's for you. It's for me. Do I get discouraged? Of course I do. Do I get upset at God in a way? Yes, I do. Because I prayed for this, prayed for this, prayed for this. And it's just like, okay, Lord, I'm not praying for it anymore. I, you're not deaf. You're not an unjust judge. And you know what I prayed for? It might just require to be done in the future. Because you know my future. And um, so faith, well, it's powerful. And when people say <clears throat> they have faith and they believe God and everything's all well and they don't attend church or they attend it sporadically, you know, <clears throat> they're not serving God. And if they don't have the Holy Ghost then they, and they think they do, you know, that's a witness. And that's a sign. I think, I think that's why God gives us kind of simple things to understand. I think that's why tongues are a part of receiving the Holy Ghost. Every time somebody received the Holy Ghost that's documented and written in the Scripture, it talks about they spoke in other tongues or languages. Because there is something that happens when God gets involved. The supernatural. It's not natural. It's supernatural. It's a God thing. And when it's a God thing, all things are different. Well, the Bible says you're a new creature. You're a new creation. When God says all things have become new, you know what? You just stepped into a realm. When you, when you get into the realm of the kingdom of God and you're dealing with the king of that kingdom and you're humbling yourself to that king and you're serving that king and you're worshiping him for who he is, respect him in reverence of him. You know, all these things are mentioned in scripture about these heroes of faith. Moses feared. He reverenced him. All of them did that. Otherwise, they would have never done. They just respected God, had a respect for God. And um, they weren't perfect. The scripture points out, and God does that as the author, shows in perfect, in, 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 that they're imperfect, that some flaws in their character. Why? So you don't idolize them. You know, these, these uh, Hollywood idols that people go gaga over, I mean, they're so full of flaws and sin, and yet they idolize them. Well, what do you think, God, if people, you know, stepped out in faith and did great things, and they did. We're going to go, and I'm going to read some of the things, <clears throat> just to remind us of how great the God we serve is. Because the people were not perfect. Who's the only human being that was perfect? The Lord Jesus Christ himself. And that's a fact. 
Paul said he was the, what, chiefest of sinners? Paul? Mm-hmm. And, you know, I, I guess, you know, when, when the Lord dealt with Peter, Peter just, you know, humbled himself and said, oh, I'm such a sinner. And, and, and I think if we can get into the realm of faith, we can see how God sees us. He sees us through the blood. He sees us through the covenant that he brought to pass. It was his work. It was his grace. And when he said it was finished, he didn't mean that everyone saved. What it meant was now is the possibility for human beings to be saved. The door is open, and I'm the door. And until I shut it, you can be saved. Can you say amen? Amen. That's what he meant that it was finished. He did everything the scripture said and pointed to about the Christ, and he fulfilled it. And when he fulfilled it, he said, it is finished. And now he's come back, and we're going to t- discuss this a little bit. Well, the day of Pentecost is coming. That was 50 days after they left Egypt on the Passover. You know, we call it Easter, but really Easter is not in your Bible. It's Passover. It's mentioned once in your Bible, but that's because it was interpreted that way. But the Greek says Passover. So when they took off from Egypt and they ate their lamb prior to that, and 50 days came to pass. Well, 50 days, after 50 days, Jesus told them, he didn't tell them the day, but Jesus said, tarry in Jerusalem until you be endued with power from on high, right? Talking about the promise of the Father. <clears throat> it was 50 days from his death that the day of Pentecost came, and they were all filled with the Holy Ghost. And I discussed that with our Sunday school uh, teachers this morning, and it was really a feast of uh, part of the Feast of Weeks. It was one of uh, three that every male was required to show up in Jerusalem and present himself before the Lord. And it was the harvest, the waving of the sheaf. And so it was a, a, a feast that talk, dealt with harvest. I mean, what a blessing. On the day of Pentecost, they were just there because they were told to be there, tarry there, and they were worshiping God, and all of a sudden, like a rushing mighty wind, whoo, it was beautiful, and it was a harvest. So scripture is so beautiful how it's like a puzzle and it fits together, but it's all because of faith. If they didn't have faith in the words of Jesus Christ, they never would have went back to Jerusalem and stayed there tearing and worshiping God for that many days until God showed up. That showed diligence, didn't it? That pleased God, and God blessed them and filled them all with the Holy Ghost. And I want to mention to my Catholic friends, and I was raised a Catholic, Mary was there and got filled with the Holy Ghost. Amen. So, the mother of Jesus. All right. So, I wanted to get to, um, I lost my place. I want to get to Hebrews and mention a few things about the faithful. It talks about, and I mentioned, you know, it talks about, well, Abraham. It talks about, you know, um, Isaac and Jacob and Joseph and Moses, Rahab. It talks about, um, about look, listen to what it says about Moses. Moses, <clears throat> by faith, Moses, when he was come to years, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter. Choosing rather to suffer affliction with the people of God than to enjoy the pleasures of sin for a season. For a season. God considers our life like a season. You know, it's here and it's gone. And uh, Moses chose to stick it out with God's people by faith. And esteeming the reproach of Christ rather than riches than the treasures of Egypt. 
for he had respect unto the recompense of reward. And it goes on to talk, and by faith he forsook Egypt, not fearing the wrath of the king, for he endured as seeing him who is invisible. How? By faith. He heard the word of God. He did have a vision, and it might have been uh, something that just took him and, and, and finally kind of finalized. He heard about the God of, you know, Abraham. He heard about, you know, God through his parents. His parents taught him, no doubt, when he was an infant. And then they lost him, of course. And he was schooled in Pharaoh. But that was all the plan of God. And so you can see how God's hand was in all of it. Well, then you go on to talking about Joshua taking the reins, and he goes in, and the, the walls of Jericho fall down. I mean, they weren't just pushed over. I mean, these were massive walls. If they were pushed over, it would have been a massive amount of rocks they would have had to try to scale over like a mountain. Because uh, What does the scripture say, Brother Bland? Was it three chariots uh, thick? Yeah. And uh, so I believe they were pushed down. They fell down, pushed down. It could have been the angels of the Lord just got all around there and just forced that rock into that dirt. And they just walked over plain ground because they, they totalized and just destroyed that city. And it was a warning to other cities. And they, other cities feared the God of the Jews, the Hebrews. But it was by faith. It just didn't happen that on, in a moment's time. They were told to go seven days. Was it seven days around that city? And on the seventh day, you see, their diligence, their obedience pleased God, and the supernatural happened by faith. And so, <clears throat> okay, Rahab, then it goes on. And what shall I say more, the writer of Hebrews says, for the time should fail me to, to tell you about uh, Gideon and of Barak and, and of Samson. And it goes on to talk about David and Samuel and who through faith subdued kingdoms, wrought righteousness, obtained promises, stopped the mouth of lions, quenched the violence of fire, uh, escaped the edge of the sword, out of weakness were made strong, wax valiant in fight, turned to flight the armies of the aliens. This is God's earth. The earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. The sea and all that's in it, it's the Lord's. This property is God's. And aliens... The wicked, the unbelieving, have taken over it. And it's going to come to an end one day. For the Lord himself, when that trump shall sound, <laughs> I'm telling you, God's going to take it over. And he, the scripture says, you know, we talk about the gentleness of Jesus. And God, we know his heart is gentle and full of compassion. But in that day... When he rules with an arm of iron, fist of iron, a rod of iron, he's going to rule. And I'm telling you, for a thousand years, people are going to fall in line with his kingship and his rulership, his authority. And when they do, it'll be a good thing. Matter of fact, when he takes in charge, nature is going to be at peace. The lion and the lamb will lay together. The child will not be afraid of the adder, the poisonous snake. It, nature, storms, hurricanes, tornadoes, all that is not going to happen during his reign. But that's in the future. In the meantime, we've got to deal with the wicked, the unbelieving, who mock God, who put to death Christians because their religion is their religion, and they have the okay from the devil, and that's who their God is, whether they know it or not. 
to do what they do. And God's going to only put up so much with that. And then it's going to all come crashing down. When you look at the scripture and talk about you know, <clears throat> Arm, uh, Armageddon and you're talking about um, great tribulation. As such that none has ever happened like in this time of tribulation. And it talks about what happens to the people on earth. These people are the ones that are here because they reject him. They reject his word. In fact, they probably put to death people that love God and believe the word of God. And uh, governments are going to come down. Kingships and kings and presidents are going to come down. And at the end, they're all going to kneel before him at the white throne judgment. And they're all going to confess that Jesus Christ is Lord of lords and king of kings. But in the meantime, we live by what? Faith. We live by faith. It's a living faith. And these have a good report. Listen to what the scripture says. They did all these things. Uh, the women received their dead, raised to life again. Others were tortured and accepted deliverance, uh, not accepting deliverance. And they might, they might obtain a better resurrection. And others had trial and cruel mockings and scourging. Yes, moreover, of bonds and imprisonment. They were stoned. They were sawed asunder, were tempted, were, uh, were slain with the sword. They wandered about in sheepskins and goatskins, being destitute, afflicted, tormented, ill-treated, if you will. Huh? Of whom the world was not worthy. They wandered in deserts and in the mountains and in dens and in the caves of the earth. They were on the run. When the Romans decided with Nero to go after the Christians, they burned them alive and lit up their uh, streets with human beings on, on crosses or stakes. They fed them to lions. They cut them in pieces. I don't even want to talk about it, but this is, you know, the, the devil's children. And these all have obtained a good report. And these all have obtained a good report. And why is that? Through faith. Though they received not the promise then, God having provided some much better thing for us. We're talking about the New Testament. That they without us should not be made perfect or complete. See, we're all together in this, but the church is something particular, different. The church of the Old Testament was unique. But the church of the New Testament is the body of Christ. There is a difference. And the Bible goes on to say this. Wherefore, seeing we also are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which does so easily beset us, and let us run with patience the race that is set before us. And what are we looking for? We're looking unto Jesus the author and the finisher or completer or perfecter of our faith. Amen. My time is just about up. But anybody else want to add to the lesson this morning? I say keep running the race. Keep living by faith. We don't know what's going to happen in the near future. We know what's going to happen in the future future. It's all going to be good. God's going to be in control. He's in control now, but, the, but he's allowing evil its place. And he's dividing humanity. He's going to test hu human beings to see where they want to stand. They're either going to be for God or against God. They're going to live by faith or they're going to be aliens and enemies of the cross. And so, my friend, my brothers, my sisters, all I can say is this. Carry your cross. Follow Jesus. Run the race. It's not to the swiftest, but if you endure to the end, you'll be diligent. Your faith 
will be rewarded by God himself who will say, well done. Thou good and faithful servant. Well, it's not a bed of roses, and God didn't say what it was going to be. He says those that are going to live in godly in Christ Jesus are going to what? Suffer persecution. Yeah, we live in an ungodly world, but we can be the lights. We can allow the light of Christ to shine through us. We can speak words of truth, and we can be witnesses for him, amen, in this lost, dark, dying world. Say amen. Say, let's just give the Lord a hand clap and just enjoy his presence. <laughs> hallelujah. 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 Amen. God bless you. God reward your faith as you be diligent in serving him.